Hey, good morning, everybody, and I want to welcome those of you who are watching online today. And if you're watching during one of our normal worship times, 9.30 and 11.15, can I ask you just to click on that Connect tab? Let us know that you're with us today. We'd love the opportunity to extend a more personal welcome to you. If you're watching after uh, one of those times, or maybe you're watching on our YouTube channel or just going back for the rebroadcast, you can go to our website, thebridgeli.com, and at the bottom of the homepage, there's a blue bar that says connect. And we would love the opportunity again just to say hello, let you know what's going on in the life of our church. I do want to tell you that at the end of the service today, I'm going to be leading us through communion. And so if you're home, let me just ask you, find some bread and some juice have that ready so that when we get to that, that time in the service at the end, I can lead you as well through that time together. We're starting a brand new series today called Bottom of the Ninth. What happens when you're feeling down and out? That's where we're going to go for the next few weeks. And I, I know that this series, I'm prayerful that it's going to represent a breakthrough in your life. So for right now, check out this video as we get started. We're all tied up here in the ninth. Two and two is the count. Two outs and a man on third. The pressure is on for these young men. They've all worked so hard for this moment. One run is all they need to win it all. We're going to start a brand new series today. And in order to do that, I want to ask you a baseball trivia question. How many of you know the name Francisco Cabrera? Now, if you don't know that name, before we leave today, you're going to discover who he is and what you and I might have in common with him. So hold that thought. Now, I want, I want to explain to you why we're doing a series called Bottom of the Ninth. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever felt behind? Have you ever felt like no matter what you did, you couldn't get ahead? You couldn't see a way out? You didn't know how something was going to correct itself or how it was going to turn out? For, for example, I mean, we, here we are. We live in the New York area. It's push, 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 go, go, go. And, and oftentimes, we have a to-do list. Have you ever felt like, like when you had a score, like you versus your to-do list? It's like your to-do list, 27. You, three. Think about that. Go, push, get ahead, don't lag behind. Or have you ever felt behind in a relationship? Maybe you just feel stuck. Maybe you have felt behind financially or physically or emotionally, maybe even spiritually. You know, a friend of mine said once, I'm so far behind in exercise that I don't even go to the gym anymore because I don't even know where to start. And the more this goes on, the worse the score gets. And in these moments, what we feel is down and out. And we actually feel like these emotions go together. How you doing? I'm kind of down and out. And I, I want to take you on a journey because I'm not, I'm not denying the down moments in your life and in mine, but here's where we're going to go in this series over the next few weeks because I think if we're honest, forget, forget we, if I'm honest, there have been days throughout this last season I have felt deflated, defeated, tired, 
wondering how we're going to get around the next corner, and all of those things. But I don't think that's just this past season. I think for some of us, that kind of describes how we feel about what happens in our lives. And I, I, I want to talk about this for the next few weeks because you and I may be down, but we're not out. You may be down financially, but you're not out. You may be down in a relationship with a spouse or a son or a daughter, but you're never out. Follow me. You may be down emotionally, physically, even spiritually, but I'm going to make the case today and as we move through this that you're never out. There's hope. And and by the way, this isn't some pie-in-the-sky moment. It's based on a truth that doesn't deny your reality. It actually deals with it. See, these are the moments that that I call bottom-of-the-ninth moments. In a baseball game, the bottom of the ninth never happens unless you, the home team, are behind or tied. This means some sort of a struggle has happened. It's rarely fun, but it is always challenging. In fact, I have to tell you, some of the greatest moments in baseball history have been bottom of the ninth moments. I'm going to show you a quick video this morning that symbolizes where we're going in this series because there's someone in this clip that represents you. There's someone in this clip that represents the, the, the people or the challenges that you're facing. And most of all, it illustrates that while you most certainly might feel down because of what we're going to discover today, You're never out. Let's watch the clip. Cisco Cabrera comes to the plate to bat for the pitcher. He hacked at the 2-0, now the 2-1. Line drive and a base hit! Just as the score of the tying run, Green to the plate! And he is safe! Safe at the plate! The Braves go to the World Series! The unlikeliest of heroes wins the National League Championship Series for the Atlanta Braves. Francisco Cabrera, and Atlanta pulls out game seven with three runs in the bottom of the ninth inning. You know what most people forget is that the Braves had gone up three games to one. All they had to do was win one game, and they would win the pennant. Then, (laughs) in an electrifying set of circumstances, the momentum shifted. The Pirates won game five, then game six, and then they went up three to one in game seven. The situation was dire. All of the momentum was on the side of the Pirates. And we went to the bottom of the ninth. The Braves finally scored a run, but then came the first out. Then the second. With the World Series, the pennant, and the entire game on the line, up steps a little-known player named Francisco Cabrera. In fact, he had been on the bench most of the series and all of game seven. He had 10 at-bats the entire season. He had one at bat in the series and he struck out. He was down to one last out. And if that wasn't bad enough, standing on second base representing the winning run was arguably, arguably, one of the slowest runners in baseball. Sid Bream. The reality today is a lot of you and me from time to time feel like Francisco Cabrera. All the momentum is going against you. All the pressure is on you. And then standing on second base 
is the slowest husband, job, financial situation, family member, relationship, you're most certainly down. But our aim and mission today is to convince you to do what Francisco did. Despite the situation, despite what happened in the past, pick up your bat and step up to the plate. You're down, but you're not out. In fact, as the great <laughs> New York Yankee Yogi Berra once said, some of you are saying this out loud right now. I see lips moving. It ain't over till it's over. Today, I simply want us to hear from the most reliable, credible source there has ever been on turning hopelessness around, turning despair around, battling back from loneliness, depression, and all of that, even if you're down, I simply want to share a story and ultimately four words, four words from Jesus himself. And in this series, we're going to lean on these four words. And while you may be down, the truth of these four words will have profound impact on you. Some of you today need a breakthrough. That's what my prayer is. That's what our prayer is for you in this series. And it starts with this story and ultimately these four words. And here's what these words are going to do. They aren't going to deny your reality. They're going to deal with your reality. But when it comes to the reality of your situation, here's where we're going today. Don't let your past failures or your current reality define you. Let God define you. The goal of today's message is simple. There's still reason to hope. There's still reason to not give up. And by the way, you don't have to take my word for it. Let me take you to the New Testament of the Bible, the second half, if you will. And we meet this guy named Matthew. We know that, that, that he was a tax collector, really wasn't, uh, wasn't the best guy. And, and um, he watches Jesus. He walks with Jesus. And he writes about what he sees. And this is what he says. One day, a rich young man approached Jesus. And he asked Jesus a question, which resulted in a conversation that was so insightful that it ultimately landed in the Bible. This conversation will lead us to our four words that you will walk away with today. The question was this. Matthew chapter 19 verses 23 to 26. What good thing must I do? What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a question about heaven. It's a question about a relationship with God. And reading between the lines here, this young man apparently feels like he's doing pretty well. I mean, he, he doesn't ask what good things? He actually asks, what good thing? Like, like singular. And Jesus begins a dialogue, not only with this man, but with you and with me. That's what he says to him. Why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want eternal life, keep the commandments. Now, by the way, what Jesus is doing here is what any great lawyer does. A great lawyer never asks a question or makes a statement unless they know the answer or the direction that the conversation is going to go in. So the young man replies. Remember his question? Why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who's good. If you want eternal life, keep the commandments. And the young man says, well, 
which ones? So Jesus lists a few. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor. <laughs> to which the young man replies, check, check, check. Okay. What else? In his eyes, he was just a little ways away from working himself and working his way to God. And then in a moment that would have made Matlock proud, for those of you for whom I'm dating myself, Matlock was a TV lawyer. This is what Jesus says. Sell your possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, and come follow me. It's as if in an instant, Jesus lifts up a mirror, points it in front of the young man, and shows him what's really going on in his heart. He actually walks away from Jesus. Let me repeat that. He walks away from Jesus. And then Jesus makes this statement. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, listen to me, okay? This has often been thought that Jesus was making a statement on wealth. And there is some validity to the understanding that wealth can lure us into taking our eyes off of our Heavenly Father. But I don't think that's the point that Jesus is making here. He's making a much bigger statement than one about wealth. And, and I believe that because of the next verse, the next verse reveals the responses of the disciples. You have to see this. Their response reveals the ultimate point that Jesus is making here. See, the disciples were men of little means. Or you would think, that, you know, you'd think they would be applauding Jesus, right? Like a little class warfare here, like way to go, way, way to stand up for, you know, the down and the out and, and, and the poor and the challenge. That's right, Jesus, you, you tell these rich people. But their response takes this conversation in a completely different direction. They take it, in fact, in the direction that Jesus wants it to go. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. I mean, why were they astonished at this statement? I mean, I mean it, it kind of makes sense, right? But to understand this, we've got to understand the cultural context. See, in those days, it was, it was kind of perceived that God, or the gods, if you will, favored wealthy people. Wealth meant you were blessed and you had God's favor. So when Jesus makes the statement that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, the disciples are shocked. They immediately think of themselves. They think if it's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven, to have a relationship with God, then what about us? And this leads them to the question Jesus has been leading them to the entire time. Here's what they asked. Who then can be saved? In other words, Jesus, if it's impossible for rich people, then can anyone be saved? Because our culture has taught us that if they're rich, they must be blessed. They must have favor with the gods. I mean, you're basically saying they're not getting in either? I mean, is there anything we can do to be saved? And the response of Jesus is, no. <laughs> it's impossible. Look what it says, verse 26. Jesus looked at them and said, 
with man, this is impossible. We're talking about bottom of the ninth moments. We're talking about the bottom of the ninth moment you may be facing. It could mean you're behind relationally, financially, emotionally, physically, vocationally, and I'm not making light of that. But what Jesus is pointing us to is a bottom of the ninth moment that, is, that, that, that was far worse than anything you and I currently face. You see, left to our own devices, we're hopelessly behind in a relationship with God. And, and so like the rich young man, we try we go to mass, we go to services, we drop money in the plate, we go serve at this or we go do that and, and then the list goes on and we try and we try and those things are good. But if we aren't careful, it's as if we walk up to Jesus and we say, hey, look at all of this. What else do I need to do? And when we think like this, we become like the rich young man in the story. And Jesus says to us, hmm, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for you to have a relationship with God. We think that's offensive. I'm doing all the right things standing up for all the right things, saying all the right things, checking off all the boxes. And the reason it's offensive is we have no understanding of the glory, the holiness, the awesomeness of the God that we're dealing with. And left to our own religions and our own religious devices, it's hopeless. It's the bottom of the ninth, and you're down by a billion runs. I was not much of an athlete. I often joke that I had two left feet. But I remember one specific basketball game my eighth grade year. And that's going back 33 years or something like that. <laughs> Tried out for the team, made the team, never played a game, which was probably good for the team. <laughs> but I remember one day, the score was 100 points plus for the opponent team, for the opposing team and maybe 10 for us. And it was the last five minutes of the game, and because the coach had nothing more to lose, he put me in the game. Now, I would love to tell you that the supernatural power of God came over me, and I scored 100 points in five minutes. I scored nothing. And that game came to a close. And then in sports, they came up with this thing called the mercy rule. See, nowadays, that wouldn't even happen in Little League or basketball or whatever it is because what, what happens is at some point, if you're down by 30 points, they just keep the clock running the whole time. Or for, in, in baseball, they call the game after five innings. In, in other words, there's no hope for you to turn this around so we're calling the mercy rule to spare you the shame and despair of losing almost to an extreme. Can I tell you today that in much the same way, Jesus looked at our plight that we all have sinned 
missed the mark and, and fallen short of the glory, the awesomeness of God. We were down by a billion points, and Jesus intervened, and, and it's why he answered this question, who then can be saved? It's why he answered it this way. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. What Jesus was alluding to was his mission to the world, to the planet, that with everything stacked against us, when, when sin had caused an impossible bottom of the ninth moment, when the world was revealing the depth of its brokenness, Jesus stepped in. He became the bridge. He became the payment for our sin. And through him, we could make our way to a holy God because a holy God has made his way to us. It's why while hanging on the cross, Jesus uttered three pivotal words. It is finished. Game over. The rest of the world saw Good Friday as two outs and strike one. Then Saturday came and it became two outs and strike two. And on Sunday morning, the most improbable, seemingly impossible event of all time took place. Jesus walked out of the tomb and issued the ultimate reminder, the ultimate declaration that with God, all things are possible. Here's why this is vitally important to where you might be today. If God can bring Jesus back from the grave... He can bring your marriage back from the grave. If God can bring Jesus back from the grave, he can most certainly bring your finances or your business back from the grave. If God can bring Jesus back from the grave, he most certainly can bring your emotions out of the throes of despair and hopelessness. You see, my friends, with God, four words, <laughs> all things are possible. And here's what I believe Jesus wants us to walk away with today, especially those of you who are facing bottom of the ninth moments. It's these four words, with God, Anything is possible, people. And knowing this, we should be anything as possible, people. We should be anything as possible kinds of people. Go back to the bottom of the ninth in 1992. I was 17 years old. David Justice was on third, and after the game, this was what David Justice said while he was on third base. When the count was two balls and no strikes, I knew Francisco was going to get a good pitch to hit. And he fouled off the pitch. That's when I thought, we are going to lose. Because I knew he wouldn't get another good pitch to hit. Who's telling you in your life that the game is over? Who's telling you there's no way out? Who's telling you that all is lost and hope is gone? 
it's time for you and me to start listening to a new voice. Sid Bream was on second. And as we've already stated, your situation probably looks bleak, like Francisco's. Not only do you need to get a hit, but you have to get arguably one of the slowest people in baseball to home plate. Don't let your situation define you. You let God define you. And here's how you make this actionable where you live and in the situation that you face. Ready for this? This verse can change your life. Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. So here's what I want you to do. Three things. Pick an area, select one area, and step up to the plate. Because we know what happens. Cabrera has a heck of a hit. And Sid Bream comes running home and by the skin of his teeth scores the run. Why don't you tell why don't you tell me one area of your life that you feel is a bottom of the ninth moment. Maybe it's not the bottom of the ninth. It might be more like a bottom of the fifth. But if you don't do something now, it'll only get worse. Some of us have given up And this area just keeps getting worse. I want you to select one area and then step up to the plate by coming back next Sunday or or, or tuning in at thebridgeli.com or YouTube, The Bridge Church LI, next Sunday. How simple is that? Pick one area and come back next week. Also, I'd like you to let us pray for you. You know, we live in a world that throws out this line. You're in our thoughts and prayers. You're in our thoughts and prayers. I'll be praying about that. But I sometimes wonder, do we really pray when we say that? Or is that just something we say? See, some of us are in bottom of the ninth moments and the most important thing you could do is allow someone to pray for you and to pray over you. So if you're watching right now at 9.30 or 11.15 on our Bridge Church online feature and you see that little chat room, there's a live prayer button Click on that. Then if you look at the top of of your page, there's some tabs. One of those will come up with whoever's hosting that room, and they'll pray for you. For those of you that are here today, sitting in the room, every week now as we move forward, across the hall on the other side, the, the old worship space, if you will, our prayer team is ready to pray with you with social distancing and all of that, but We'd like to pray for you. Maybe you just want to visit thebridgeli.com and there's a spot there for prayer. Tell us what's going on. We don't broadcast that unless you give us the freedom to share it. But somebody wants to pray for you. And our prayer is that you'll experience or begin to experience a breakthrough in one or more of the areas that you feel left behind or you feel are 
lagging behind. I mean, just by being here today, you've said you have some challenges. I mean, I have challenges, and I'm, I'm like the preacher. You've come to the right place. A safe place. A place that loves you just as you are. But a place that loves you enough to challenge you not to stay where you are. Would you just step out today? Make the decision to come back next week or to dial in or tune in next week and to take the opportunity to let someone pray for you and pray over you. Let me start that today. God, I really believe that there are many people that are watching today and saying, I have had or I'm living in a bottom of the ninth season. today, God, I thank you for your spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit calling me and every person watching this today to be filled with your spirit, to experience the power of God, the presence of God the peace of God, the provision of God that allows us to walk forward to be able to say, I may be down, but because the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me, I'm never out. I may be inconvenienced. I may have seasons of of, of, of pain and, and some seasons of despair but I'm not defeated because I'm a child of the living God and some of you may say today as we're praying Pastor Dad I don't, I don't even know if I'm a child of God and I just want to invite you today to simply say God my life is in your hands I'm committing myself to you because you committed yourself to me and loved me first And I want you to know, if you had any doubt and you said that, the spirit of the living God is taking up residency within you to give you a power that you haven't had before. God, thank you. Walk with us, Lord, through this series, through this season of life in our own lives, in our families' lives, in our communities, in our nation, and in the world. And show us your hand. In Jesus' name.
I'd love to invite you at this time to take that bread and that juice that maybe you set aside for this time that we're going to share together. Those elements, if you will, that bread and that cup, they represent, they represent a pivotal set of circumstances in what everybody thought was a bottom of the ninth moment over 2,000 years ago. I don't even know that the disciples fully understood what was happening when Jesus called them together, broke bread, passed it around, followed it with a cup, and said to them, this is my body, broken for you, and this is my blood, shed for you. It would be several hours later when that symbolic time would become real. They would watch as his body was broken and his blood was shed. Ever since that whole set of events, as people began to gather in Jesus' name, they would break bread and drink from a cup to remember to remember Christ's broken body and his shed blood that paved the way for that statement that we talked about in that entire talk with God, all things are possible. So right where you are right now, take that bread and that re let me remind you that, that bread that you hold or that cracker or whatever it might be that you hold in your hands is symbolic of the body of Christ that was broken for you. Eat that at this time. Now I want you to take that cup, whatever juice you have filled that with, makes no difference. God is with you and he understands. Nothing magical about this, but as you drink that, remember, that the cup poured out for you of Christ's blood was so that you could experience the forgiveness of your sins so that you, you, you could remember that God did for you what you could not do for yourself. So I encourage you at this time to drink that. Amen. I also want to invite you to give today. We often say we are a generous people because we serve a generous God. And while this has been a season of some unknowns and unpredictable things, God is anything but unknown and unpredictable. And we've watched the church take on a new shape and a new form and as we've reached people that we never thought that we could reach before, but I'd be lying to you if I didn't say to you, it's also been a really challenging time for us in many ways, not the least of which is financially. But I do, and I have always believed, always, that God's will, done God's way, will always have God's resources. And we believe that we're walking into what God has for us in this next season. And I'm asking you to join my family in giving. So as you are watching in this online experience, there's a tab that says give. Would you consider, maybe it's a one-time gift today, maybe you'll set up a recurring gift, but either way, I would be blessed in every way if you would join me in giving back to God so that we can continue to give to this community, the message of Jesus. Thank you for that. Next week, on the 13th, we're going to have our first public in-person gathering. You should have received an email. Uh, a few weeks back or maybe a couple weeks back about all of our protocols and procedures and there, there are a number of those because we are committed to making sure that this experience is the safest that it possibly can be. 
Some of you are saying, I'm ready. I'm ready. How do I register? Well, today, September the 6th, beginning at 7 p.m., you can go to our website and there'll be a very obvious spot where you can pre-register for next Sunday's experience. Now, I need you to hear me on this. You need to pre-register. You need to pre-register. That is critically important to us making sure that we can follow the protocols that we need to. But I want to say something to those of you that are sitting there saying, Dan, I'm just not ready. I still have some trepidation. I'm in that at-risk category or I'm, I'm just not comfortable. Listen to me closely because if, if I could reach out and just hold your shoulders and say to you, that is okay. We're going to continue the online experiences. Stick with those. Tune in either during the service times, because as of next week, they'll be totally live as you watch them online. They'll be exactly how they're happening right here in the space. Or you can watch them later on at at our YouTube channel or whatever. But please hear me. There is no shame at all in, in feeling like it's just not time yet. I'm totally fine with that. So we're looking forward to the days and to... Uh, the weeks ahead. If you want to know more about what's going on in the life of our church, you can visit us at thebridgeli.com. Otherwise, let me give you a blessing and you can be on your way. I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And I pray that the Lord would look upon you with his favor and give you his peace that passes all of our understanding and that that peace would guard your heart guard your mind your thoughts in Christ Jesus God bless you everybody have a wonderful day Thank you.